Starbound Alliance The Fight Against Human Oppression by Elton Gar I know none of your people like my people, and I've heard just as many stories about each of you. How you're barbarians and terrorists, how your religion means you want to exterminate us, and your histories of wars and slavery. But despite all of that, our worlds all have one thing in common. The resources and fruits of our labor are all sent to support the humans, instead of our own world," Oriteo said. And I suppose your plan is for us to send in our people to fight the humans, while you advise us on how to win," the spokesperson for the Grenter contingency said. It wasn't the worst suggestion, as the Grenter were the most impressive soldiers and in a physical fight could beat almost anyone including humans. But so long as you didn't get into direct combat with them, they were practically useless. Not exactly. None of us can fight the humans alone. My suggestion is that we all share our skills and technology. Together we can create a force the humans won't be able to stand against. And then you'll have all our technology and what will we have?" The Descender Ambassador said. He was tall even for a Descender, and his ankle-length robe had dozens of devices attached to it, most of which could do things no one else in this room had the technology to do. But while they were a brilliant and inventive species, they were also naturally peaceful, and the humans had taken advantage of that. Once they had control, they were able to take any technological advantages in return for peace. Let's just cut to the chase. We all bring something valuable, and since it's valuable, it could be used against us. That's why you were invited. You just have to be willing to accept that we have more in common with each other than the humans. Your people set off bombs in four of our cities. One of the delegation from the Ninoric Protectorate said, that was almost 70 years ago, and it was because of the destruction of the Finnan spaceport by your people," Oriteo said, allowing himself to be pulled into the argument. He then added, But we have to put all of that behind us, or the humans are going to keep exploiting us all. There was another round of arguments, and everyone listing out everything that everyone had done to them. Oriteo understood. The humans controlled almost all the galactic news, and they focused almost exclusively on things that made people angry. That had worked on Oriteo too, until he had been forced to live on a different world for a few years as an ambassador. That was when he discovered the things they said about his people. Most of them were technically true, but none of them were accurate representations of his people. The most mainstream were politicians who were appealing to a very specific group of people, and using inflammatory rhetoric to do so but they would never get more than a tiny part of what they wanted. Most of the rest were groups that the vast majority of his own people felt were repugnant. And after a couple of years of watching that news, he was almost convinced he was wrong about the world he had grown up on. The humans, it seemed, were excellent at turning people against each other, and he was convinced it was intentional. It was that belief that allowed Oriteo to stand firm, his eyes scanning the diverse faces, reflecting the resentment, fear, and suspicion that lingered in the air. He took a deep breath, choosing his words carefully to navigate the diplomatic minefield before him. I understand the grievances, the wounds, and the mistrust that history has created between us. But dwelling on the past won't change anything. The humans are exploiting our divisions, playing us against each other. If we continue this way, they will continue to manipulate us, stripping our worlds of resources and leaving us with nothing. The Grenter spokesperson crossed their arms, a skeptical expression etched on their face. And how do we know you're not just a pawn in the human's game? A well-disguised saboteur, trying to lure us out so that we can be destroyed. Oriteo sighed. He had known he faced an uphill battle. I don't expect blind trust. I propose a mutual exchange of information and technology. We can create a coalition, a force that transcends individual strengths. That might even be enough to force the humans to let us go free without a fight. A murmur of uncertainty swept through the room. The Descender Ambassador, towering above the others, finally spoke, his tone measured. Sharing our advancements means sharing our vulnerabilities. 
What assurance do we have that this coalition won't crumble under the weight of internal conflicts? Oriteo nodded, acknowledging the valid concern. We establish a council, representatives from each faction working together to ensure transparency and accountability. We build trust gradually, proving that we can overcome our differences for the greater good. Our worlds need unity, not division. As the conversation continued, Oriteo found himself drawn into a delicate dance of diplomacy, weaving through the intricate web of cultural misunderstandings and historical grievances. He spoke of shared challenges, highlighting the common ground that bound them together, urging them to rise above the narratives crafted by the humans. He had nearly gotten them to an agreement, when one of the members of the Eronian theocracy said, We will, of course, need you to all agree to ban all perfumes and deodorants. Oriteo took a deep breath to calm himself. That was enough to get a whiff of the Eronians who believed that a person's scent was sacred, and any attempt to cover that was not only dishonest but sacrilegious. The only member of the races in the room that didn't immediately begin to speak were the Exechen. They used pheromones as part of their communication and so avoided deodorants, though some used perfume, though mostly only people who had damaged their scent glands. This was at least a problem that Oriteo had planned for, so he pulled out a thick notebook and said, I thought this might come up, so I approached the leaders of the other factions on your world. We should start with the Yoatan faction. They want to outlaw walking on your shadow. It turns out they believe it's your soul. The Eronian stood up and said, The Yoatan sect are heretics and should be ignored. They are the second largest faction in your government and had a majority of seats in your government four years ago. If we include your sacred beliefs, it would make no political sense to not include theirs," Oriteo said. The Eronians began to talk, but Oriteo didn't wait. He had multiple experts who agreed that the Eronians would give up the argument that the others had to follow their religious laws to avoid having others follow the religious laws of their rivals. That was part of the reason they had decided on the Eronian theocracy as one of the governments they invited. Each of the planets would want to force some aspect of their moral beliefs on the others, but the Eronians' fervor along with the nature of their beliefs would help keep the others from the attempt, at least for now. Not that they didn't try. Now that the door to pushing their beliefs on others had been opened, there was a heated exchange with a mix of frustration and determination. The cultural intricacies of worlds that had so little in common, and no reason to care what the others did yet tried to control them, threatened to derail the coalition before it even started. The air became thick with tension, as representatives from each faction engaged in a passionate debate about the merits of various cultural practices. Oriteo calmly interjected, let's not lose sight of the bigger picture. Our goal is to unite against the humans, not to impose our cultural preferences on each other. If we insist on such conditions, the coalition will crumble before it even stands. The Grenter spokesperson, although skeptical saw things in the most direct way so said, If we start dictating each other's cultural practices, we'll never find common ground. Let's focus on the practical aspects of our alliance, and leave the religious debates for another time. Gradually, Oriteo managed to steer the conversation back toward the core objective. He proposed a compromise, suggesting that each faction could maintain its cultural practices within its own territories while adhering to a set of universally agreed-upon principles for the coalition's functioning. The Eronian representative, realizing the potential consequences of their rigid stance, reluctantly agreed to the compromise. As the discussions continued, Oriteo skillfully navigated the delicate balance between accommodating diverse beliefs and fostering unity. The council took shape, representatives from each faction tentatively agreeing to work together for the greater good. It was a fragile alliance, but Oriteo was determined to nurture it into a formidable force against the common enemy. It was about that time that the new assistant of the other congressman from Oriteo's world stood up. She was an odd woman from one of the outer provinces and had been given the job because of powerful connections. Not that she wasn't efficient, but using that much influence to become the assistant to a first-term congressperson with very little chance of being re-elected 
had been odd enough to keep Oriteo's attention. But as she spoke more harshly of the humans than anyone, and had helped considerably in getting everyone they wanted to this meeting, he had put aside those questions. She walked out, leaving her large briefcase as she did. Another tiny oddity, because she never let that briefcase out of her sight, and so far as he knew she never opened it. And when he glanced at it, he saw a red light blinking. Almost without thinking, he bent down and flipped the latch. The briefcase fell open to reveal a pile of pamphlets from one of the Grenter terrorist groups. But that made no sense. The Grenter here were working directly against that group, and no one from Oriteo's world would work with them. He didn't have time to work that out because the rest of the briefcase was filled with small gray blocks, a number of wires, and a clock that had just counted down to three. There was no time for warning, and he knew it wouldn't matter, but Oriteo threw himself on top of the briefcase. As it exploded, he was still trying to understand what had happened. As soon as she was outside of the door of the meeting room, Ashley began to sprint down the hallway. She only had 30 seconds before her briefcase killed everyone in this part of the station, and while her escape wasn't important to the plan, she'd prefer to survive. Making it through the hard metal door she pushed it shut and sat next to it, her back against the thick metal, her body curled up. The door hit her hard enough to bruise her entire back, but she survived, and looking injured would help her keep her cover. No one seemed to notice a single young woman walk out of the building, and watching a small human ship take off was dutifully ignored by everyone because it was just safer to ignore the humans. Once in orbit, Ashley connected to the secure human network. I see you survived, her handler said. He showed no sign he was happy that she had survived. The job is done. There were at least nine priority targets in the room. And there was no connection to humans, he said. There were no humans there, according to all the records. And there is a group of Grenter who have been paid well to claim responsibility. Is anyone actually going to believe that the Grenter could do this? It's just not how they think. It's always worked before, Ashley said, almost hoping that people would realize that even when it wasn't humans pretending to be members of the other races, that it was the humans who focused on splinter groups and relatively tiny events to keep everyone working against each other. Ashley turned off the communicator and watched the stars. She hated what she had done, but it had helped her escape the crushing poverty and struggles of Earth and it would keep the other races from taking away the small amount of power she had. Author's Note One of the only true weapons that the powerful, elite, and all the others who want to keep power over people have, is creating disharmony between the groups of people they are oppressing, because so long as you're focused on other people who also have no real power, instead of the people who do, you're never going to truly change things. To that end, there are a couple of simple axioms that are helpful for me. The first is that you have more in common with almost anyone, even the people you are told to hate, than you do with a billionaire, politician, or even powerful news pundits. The other is that people with less power than you are never the source of your problems. I hope you enjoyed this story. If you did, then you can get more of my stories every week by signing up for my newsletter at ansci-fi.com and following the link that reads free book. Or get Patreon exclusive stories every week at patreon.com slash Elton. Thank you. Elton Gar.